session from the webinar, webinar of Kring and FAIR. Um, this will be very interesting, I think, because we are going to address some um, discussions, dilemmas that we are all facing in the coast, meaning sea level rise and coastal communities who should adapt or at least be aware of the challenges that we are all facing. Um, can't thank you, someone is helping me with pe letting people in. Very good. Uh, we will have two, two presentations, one from Benjamin Hext from Wales, and next uh, will be Steve McFarlane from Scotland. Thank you very much, Steve, that you're here, even though you have COVID at the moment. <laughs> so it still is running around, a stupid um, disease. Well, it's what it is. Very happy that you're here, groggy and all. Um, we would like to suggest that you ask your questions during in the chat, and we will have we will address those questions after they both have uh, have ended their presentation. Um, so I just say, Benjamin, please could you also introduce yourself? You know a little bit what you do, who you are, and give the floor to you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks ever so much, uh, Petra and the the Kringer group for bringing us along today. Um, I'm Ben Hext. I'm a lead specialist advisor in uh, Natural Resources Wales um, as, as part of a, the flood risk analysis and asset group. So I come from a background of um, site survey geophysics as well as many years in flood risk mapping and modelling and then more recently um, a couple of years in trying to deliver a couple of coastal adaptation projects which brought many, many challenges. And then uh, more recently moved roles into a sort of more of an oversight role and looking at um, our sort of flood risk evidence base as well as how we manage assets moving forwards as well. So um, yes, yeah, so today I'm presenting for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then I'll be handing over to Steve from um, Scottish Environment Protection Agency, who are kind of the equivalent bodies, one for Wales, one for, uh, for Scotland. And then hopefully we can have some discussion at the end and um, some thoughts around the, the two different types of approaches and where the different nations are at. So without much further ado, um, um, hopefully everybody can see my slide pack and I'll just flick through on, on, on the screen. Um, so brief introduction. So um, here we are. This is uh, this is Wales. It's a nation on the uh, the western side of the United Kingdom, for those who didn't know. Uh, we border England to our east uh, with the Bristol Channel, which is a major shipping channel to the southwest, uh, the Irish Sea to our west and Liverpool Bay to our north. So we have about a population of just over 3 million people and a, a land mass of about 20,000 square kilometers. And for those, um, so Welsh is a sort of the the, the the language for Wales and uh, those who, who uh, can decipher it, the map is I found a, a Welsh version of the European map um, to add a bit of interest to the discussion. So um, our coastline, so we have 2740 kilometres of coastline around Wales and it supports 60% of the population uh, and that's around about 93,000 jobs. 77% of the coastline is designated. So that's um, for those who are aware of them, the triple SIs, SPAs, Ramsar, marine protected, air, marine protected areas and heritage coast. And our coastline supports recreation, tourism and the well-being of many people as well as the local economies. So who are we? And, you know, what is Natural Resources Wales? So we're a Welsh government funded body. Um, and we ca we come to, we're a, a joint body or a new body formed from three fairly significant organisations within Wales. Um, the part I came from is the Environment Agency Wales. So we used to do a lot of work. We kind of, a mirror image of how the Environment Agency act in England. Um, so we were just a, a, an extra um, region for that for, for the Environment Agency. Um, the Countryside Council for Wales and the Forestry Commission for Wales. So 
this gives us a really um, quite a wide remit, um, but this brings strengths and all, also weaknesses. So what do we do? So that I guess the principles of what we do is um, and around our remit is to ensure that the natural resources of Wales are sustainably managed and maintained, used and enhanced now and into the future. So we cover many different bases. We have a, a forestry, huge forestry sector we manage. Um, we have teams who um, look after the biodiversity of Wales, the flood protection of Wales, so the, the element that I'm involved with, um, access and recreation, fisheries, education and data, and environmental um, and sites protection, as well as we seem to run many mountain bike centres as well, which is sort of the, the bit I'm often interested in at weekends. And alongside that, we have to deal with many day-to-day -day issues, flood risk, pollution, um, air quality issues from industry, um, tree disease, um, our, forest, our forestry guys have to deal with, um, degraded habitat and biodiversity loss, and competing demands on the coastal sector now. Um, so, you know, we, we cover, as a one organisation, we cover such a huge remit, and I feel like, you know, quite a small part of that now. So within our in the flood risk remit, um, we cover the we have a roles and responsibilities for what's known as main rivers and the sea. Um, so main rivers are just a legal designation in in Wales and England about um, a particular type of river, and it's no, no reflection of the, the actual size of it. Uh, they tend to be the bigger rivers, and um, we have colleagues across 22 local authorities who deal with smaller water courses as well as surface water flooding. Uh, they also deal with a lot of coastal issues as well. Um, and then we have an umbrella role to manage all flood risk management authorities or an oversight role. We operate the flood warning system for Wales and we respond to flooding and we manage flood defences and their change now and into the future. So the challenges at the coast. Well, challenges at the coast, they're just not, they're not a new thing for any nation. Um, here we can see one of our significant floods in the past, back in 1990, so March 1990. And all those dots in the, um, around this area, these are all static caravans that have all been uh, washed in land from this 500 metre breach here. So that was, um, this is actually a railway line running along here. Let's see if I can use a different pointer. So this is a, a railway line along here. And then this asset was built by the railway company just to protect the railway line. But unfortunately, um, huge swathe of development and caravans built up over time behind there, as pro probably find in many um, countries around Europe. And then when this breached, um, all the many many static caravans were blown inland and there's about 5,000 properties flooded it was one of the biggest peacetime evacuations since the war uh, for the united kingdom so fast forward 23 years something similar happened again um not to quite the same extent and lessons had been learned from that 1990 event but also much had been forgotten most of the staff involved with the, the 1990 floods had all moved on, retired. And actually this, the 2013 and 2014 coastal floods around Wales were, came as quite a shock to many of us in the industry. Um, and we had to move forward with some sort of more thinking. Um, and the, this map, map down here just represents the damage in ec economic damage around the coast from the different storms. So blue dots are from the December storm and a month later we were hit on the west coast and the red dots represent the, the damage in the economic asset damage to those. So not only did we have infrastructure and people affected by 
um, such floods. Um, we had wider storm effects as well from this particular storm and, and, and subsequent storms as well. So, you know, a large storm comes along, it erodes soft cliffs, it smothers salt marshes with litter, erodes salt marshes, um, it exposes extensive peatlands by the coast, um, breaches, various defences and inundates coastal grazing marshes and erodes sand dunes as well. But we know that climate change um, will happen more into the future, as you can see from the figures here from the UK um, UKCP18 or Climate Projections 18, our capital in Wales, Cardiff, will be hit with potentially up to 113 centimetres more more water by the end of the, the century. Um, if we're lucky, it'll be somewhere between 27 and 69 centimetres, but that's on the, the low emission scenario. The chances are, I think we're edging more towards the high emission scenario, as can be seen in the orange. But for those who understand um, and deal with waves, you know, with more water at the coast, that just means more wave energy gets to our coast and affects our communities with more overtopping and more, more inundation. So across Wales, we know from our, our evidence base, our, our maps, um, that we've got over 71,000 properties at risk of tidal flooding um, present day. And this only increases into the future. 400 properties of those are at risk of coastal erosion. And it, it's, um, it's estimated that the coastal erosion occurs 23% of the Welsh coastline. And that risk is going to carry on over the next 100 years and increase. And this leads into some points I'll be talking about shortly. So adaptation into the future. So with all these challenges, how are we going to adapt as a nation and move forwards? And kind of what's in our toolbox to help us along this way? So we've got a range of tools, which I'll go into now. Um, so I guess starting with strategic plans, you know, how, how, do we, how do we move forwards? So we've got something called the shoreline management plans. And some of you may have come across this in the past with various talks with Environment Agency or even with, with Wales. And there is a non-statutory document that provides a large scale assessment of risks associated with coastal processes and presents a policy framework to reduce these risks to the people, uh, the developed historic and natural environment in a sustainable manner. So for Wales, we've got four of these shoreline management plans and these overlap into England and if I can see here so this is the uh, roughly the border with England around here so if we join the dots to there to there ish um, so th this these are broken into coastal cells due to sort of coastal processes and this particular cell goes from what's known as the Great Orm which is halfway along our northern coast and extends all the way up into um, almost Scotland, actually, with one on the shoreline management plan, um, two further down the west coast, and then uh, in the Severn estuary, a fourth shoreline management plan. So these these have been around for quite some time, actually. So the first round was in the early two thousands, following some. Um, what's DEFRA guidance? So DEFRA is the Department for Agricultural and Rural Affairs. Uh, sorry, Environment, Farming and Rural Affairs. Um, these were updated in twenty. Well, updated and approved in twenty by twenty fourteen and fifteen. And again, that followed updated guidance. And then we're currently those last round, round two is being refreshed. It's not it's not a full rewrite. It's being refreshed uh, currently to look at what's worked so so far, um, what what hasn't worked, and if people have looked in detail at a particular coastal area, is there anything that needs to change there? Have we got it right? 
So the principles of the, the shoreline management plan is to guide and support the planning system to discourage inappropriate development in areas at risk of flooding and coastal erosion. And we've already got plenty to deal with with legacy developments. So this is up on the west coast. Um, there's a caravan site built just behind a dune system and and pretty much on top of and through a dune system. Um, and these are pictures taken in, in January 2014. And if you look where these posts are, this is where the foot of the dune used to be. Um, waves have gradually eaten away at this to the point that in this storm, uh, the, the, the sort of the face of the dune decided to slip away. And this is my colleague stood on top of somebody's patio um, looking down the, the cliff edge or the, the cliff edge of the dune down to the sea. I think many people lost quite a few belongings on there. I don't, we don't think any static caravans were washed away, but it must have been pretty close. And it's kind of these sort of challenges, these legacy developments that are really challenging to deal with now. So this is what a shoreline management plan looks like in more detail, and it kind of breaks every part of the coast for England and Wales down into small policy units and then sub policy units. So for each of those lines that you can see on the map here, um, you can see there's three, three lines for every part of the policy unit. And each line represents a time frame of when a, an action or a management will, um, is ideally meant to take place. So for the inner line, um, on this particular example, um, it's blue. So that means within the first time frame or epoch, as it's known, is um, is what's known as a no active intervention. So it's obviously for this area, it's probably quite a natural environment already. And that time frame takes us from 2005 to 2025. The next line takes us from what should be the management policy from 2025 to 2055. And the third line takes us from 2055 to 2105. So it kind of covers a hundred year lifespan. OK, so blue meaning no active intervention. Um, orange manage realignment, green hold the line. So if we move left from this first policy unit to this one, um, there's probably I don't know this area in particular. It's just an example, but uh, there's probably some existing infrastructure and the community here and there's obviously some economic benefits to making sure that um, the the level of flood defense or and coastal erosion is sustained up until at least 2055 so for the first two time frames um, we have a hold the line policy followed by after 2055 and no active intervention so that means not actively doing anything and just allowing nature to take its course. And the third example down here on Saunders foot, which is on the left hand side of the screen, we go from green, green to amber, uh, amber or orange. So that means that by 2055 in this particular area, it's not economical to do anything and we need to seriously think about managed realignment. So that means thinking about setting back defences um allowing buffer zones and just thinking quite differently from the the traditional um hard defense um type build that we we would normally look at so what else is in the toolbox that assists with this so i think we've touched on that already we have climate change estimates from the UK climate projections 2018 and this is a Met Office uh, data set which comes from the UK, U, um, from the uh, the IPCC AR5 uh, data set and this kind of condenses it down or brings it into a portal that's useful for the United Kingdom and we can use use that and dip into there and query specific parts of the coastline and this take this sort of data takes us to 2100. Um, but also we've got some other projected data sets from the same uh, Met Office data set that takes us out for 300 years. So you can kind of seriously do some 
real long term planning on that and kind of, you know, it's quite useful for the, you know, really high level strategic plans about the real long term of towns and communities and where it will be going. Um, but obviously, as you get further out on this, the um, there's, you know, the uncertainties get greater and greater. So we tend to keep it around uh, this area here up to 2100 and that tends to uh, uh, align quite nicely with the the other uh, extract as well. So we do a lot of risk modeling in natural resources Wales, as probably many of uh, your other nation governments do as well. And this taking some offshore, um, looking at offshore conditions and do some multivariate statistical analysis on what that looks like now and what that looks like into the future, transform onto onshore through wave modeling and emulation and essentially you know, throwing those waves at the coast, undertaking some uh, overtopping analysis to start calculating, calculating return periods and then undertake some inundation modeling. So if we can do that around the coast everywhere, and it's kind of a long term program to be able to do that, um, it gives us a much clearer idea about what's um, what's the current day risk and how does that change, you know, and and almost you know, down to property level, so we can really understand um, differences moving forwards. So we embedded in that and using that as a risk as a uh, an evidence base we can apply that to the planning policy and land use planning. So this is uh, Wales. We have some um, with with regards to flood risk and the way that we the forward look our land use planning uh, does look at the, the future change in uh, the future rise in sea levels. If you want to build properties in the coastal strip as well as as, as as well as the fluvial or river corridor as well. So it's quite a difficult planning system to navigate your way through if you do want to develop in those areas um, but it's there for good reason because I think we've already got quite a legacy of communities with problems to deal with let alone allowing um, new unsustainable development in those communities as well. Um, we have design criteria and, po and other policies to help and this is to help um, risk management authorities so the likes of Natural Resources Wales, local authorities to actually design and build new flood assets um, to a fairly consistent um, picture, but also to allow adaptability into the future. So you may only be able to afford to invest in something that will be climate resilient to 2050 now, but you also need to build that so that it's adaptable at 2050 when you need to perhaps make it taller, wider or more resilient. Um, we have some really strong legislation in Wales around really thinking about the future. So we have something called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, and it's kind of it, it's about improving the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales. Acts as a legally binding common purpose with seven well-being goals for gov for the national government, local government, health boards and other public bodies such as Natural Resources Wales and it details the ways in which we must work and work together uh, to improve the well-being of, of Wales and it makes us think long term so it makes us you know, act in a manner which seeks to ensure that the needs of the present are met but without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's kind of really thinking about what your, um, you know, how your children are going to manage these resources in their generation, and how is your children's children going to manage those, and so forth. And when you, as a government body, it's quite hard to switch around to that. I think everything typically always been about the, the here and the now. Um, so it's kind of a really useful piece of legislation, um, but quite challenging. Um, so with all that in mind, there are attempts at coastal adaptation and it's really complicated. So coastal adaptation is the process of adjustment to manage the increasing risk to coastal areas associated with, associated with climate change. And by looking at coastal adaptation areas, it helps with the managed realignment or 
no active intervention shoreline management policy. It helps us manage forwards many unsustainable flood assets, which are just you know, they're on there, they're coming to the end of their usable life. Coastal squeeze offset, um, and just managing flood risk in a very different way than we traditionally would have done, with a, you know a chance, a good chance of increasing biodiversity and resilience in an area. But there's just loads of challenges around coastal adaptation, the perception, the change from the status quo that people are used to. A flood of flood defence is there and is there to protect them, and um, there's lots of legal challenges around trying to progress all this as well. Um, so this this uh, picture here is an example down on the, our south coast near the Gower. Um, this is called uh, Cum Ivy. And so far it's only the, the only place in Wales where coastal adaptation has happened. Um, we have got a programme and this, this created 39 hectares of salt marsh um, in partnership with uh, another fairly big uh, body called the National Trust. But, you know, 39 hectares is a, is a, is a drop in the ocean, in, excuse the pun, for the amount of um, salt marsh and habitat that we will need to make moving forward. So we do, we've got a programme um, of projects looking at much bigger areas, um, some of which I've been working on in my previous job. Um, uh, but they they are all fraught with 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 significant challenges. So to move forward, I guess there's there's all sorts of different options for nature based solutions as a, as an alternative to hard coastal defences, and I'm sure many of you will be probably a lot more familiar with these than I am. Um, so yeah, you know, instead of a typical sea walls, groins, and breakwaters. We can look at the, what's known as green infrastructure or nature based solutions. Um, so I think one of the. I think to help, you know, we as a public body, we kind of know roughly where we need to go, but it's kind of bringing the public and the politicians along with us. And we're just at the start of the journey, I suppose. Um, and we just need to improve. What we find is that when we've started to tackle this, that there's been a lack of understanding or awareness from um, the public. So we're trying to improve our access to information so that we're better prepared to engage as an organisation or as a nation as well. Um, so we have a range, you know, we, we make all of our evidence available online. Um, we're showing, we're entwining it into the planning system. So, you know, what the future will look like is embedded in the planning system um, and make sure that all our, our risk maps are out there. So challenges, I think the challenges so far when we have attempted um, any, any form of change is actually different. Uh, different organisations have very different planning horizons, different timescales. So if you look at anything from an individual landowner, up until you know a government body that have very different time scales that they'll be thinking about. A landowner is very much about the here and the now. Um, but we're even finding large organizations, so our um, our infrastructure providers, such as Network Rail or um, the electrical companies, and for us it's uh, Scottish Power Energy Networks, very different um, thoughts around their planning horizons, as well as their investment periods as well. And I think that we're very much ahead of the game in terms of thinking forward to the future. Um, whereas um, the likes of the railway companies tend to be stuck into five year cycles of investment and therefore don't think beyond those five year cycles. Um, and you know, so everybody will be in a different place moving forwards. And thinking about how how their business is going to tackle climate change and coastal adaptation, and we, we can't just take sustainable coastal management in isolation. We've got to do it collaboratively with a range of partners and organisations. So um, we need a collective response and action. 
will always be required at a you know quite a wide range of of, of levels so we're starting to co-produce answers where we can um so at a local level um projects can kind of try and co-produce um solutions looking at you know looking at what's the impact to the community and where could what, what can change and where can we go but that does tend to need quite specialist help so these are companies that we have used um in for helping us with engagement because as a as a public body we're not the best at engaging and it you know we don't have that skill set to deep dive into the into into how to uh, facilitate quite complex um challenging meetings but at a regional level um, we do have and this uh, from the well-being and future generations act we have something called public service boards and they bring together um local authority natural resources wales fire and rescue services the local health board the um, education authority um the police and various other bodies all into one kind of ongoing body to kind of really start to tackle what is the future going to look like and how are we going to plan across all these different bodies for change um not just at the coast but through all sorts of things like mental well-being health and, and so forth so um th there is movement in that direction okay and just to summarize we're still learning it's going to be a bumpy ride down this long road we can't do it on our own and it's going to be really expensive even if we do nothing it's going to be really expensive um and there's been there has been and there will be difficult and unpopular decisions ahead but there's great opportunity to do something different improve the environment divert di biodiversity and carbon sequestration so thank you for listening and I'm going to hand over to Steve um, to get the, the Scottish perspective. Hi everyone. So I'm still here. I'm just going to load up my presentation. Take a second. Okay, can I just check that people can see that okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, so uh, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, everyone else. Um, so my name is Steve McFarland. I work for SEPA, which is the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. As we go through the presentations, you'll see there's some differences between the Scottish EPA and our English and Welsh equivalents in terms of flooding and erosion um, duties and responsibilities. And there are also differences in how we approach coastal adaptation. Uh, there are large there are a large number of similarities, but there are differences and it'll be interesting to see those as as we go along. So my first slide, this is Montrose Beach uh, in, in, on the east coast of, of Scotland. So it's a, an eroding set of dunes. Uh, and I put this slide up for the start uh, just to try and, and make a little point that this sign says danger, keep away uh, from the dunes. And that's a very clear message, but not everyone hears the same message. So as a kid, this would have been a, 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 a sort of a, a challenge to go and climb in these dunes and see, see what I could do. So it, it certainly wouldn't keep me away. But we've got to think about the, the, the messages that we send out, not only what we're saying, but how those messages are received, because they're not always received the way we would expect. So. I'm going to start with a couple of acknowledgements. So a big thank you to the guys in Dynamic Coast. It's a Scottish government funded project that has recently looked at long term change on the Scottish coastline. 
and using that knowledge of how the coast has changed in the past to make some projections for the future, including under climate change scenarios, and also to a group called uh, Adaptation Scotland, who I uh, provide advice to public and private bodies in Scotland regarding adaptation to climate change and building resilience. So some really interesting work that they're producing. So my presentation is going to follow a similar line to, to Ben's. I'm going to give you a wee bit of background to Scotland and Scotland's coast. Look at the sort of problems we have, how uh, things are set up in terms of managing them, and then look at this tricky issue of communication and engagement. Okay. So Scotland's coast. I, we have a long coastline, more than 18,500 kilometres, and that's measured at mean high water springs. There are 900 islands, over 100 of which are inhabited. And as a whole, Scotland has around about 63% of, of the UK's exclusive economic zone. So a big chunk of the UK is in Scotland. And not directly related to this presentation, but we also have 125,000 kilometres of river and over 25,500 locks. So if you like water, it really is the place to be. So I'm going to just draw a little bit of attention to a couple of places. I'm going to try and be clever and use the pen as well. So we've got Shetland up in the north, which is our most northern islands. I'm going to talk quite a lot about the Outer Hebrides here on the west coast, in particular this little bunch of islands, the Uists in the southern part. And most of the rest of what I'm going to talk about is from this area, the northeast of Scotland. So Aberdeenshire and down the bottom end here, Montrose. So that's the main areas I'm going to, going to talk about. So most of our coast is thankfully pretty hard. So that varies between uh, dramatic cliffs and so on, like in the little picture up in the, the right hand corner here. We also have low-lying hard coast. This is Lerwick up on the Shetland Islands, but a lot of it is quite complex coast. So you've got mixtures of headlands and bays and pocket beaches, like this part of the east coast in Aberdeenshire. The bulk of the rest of the coast is soft. So we got the lovely Mr. Trump here with a couple of locals at the Balmedy Dunes in Aberdeenshire, where his uh, golf course development happened recently at uh, the other end of Montrose Beach. We got shingle and pebble and cobble beaches. Uh, and in more sheltered areas, uh, a good a good helping of salt marshes and other other sheltered uh, habitats. This particular one's just in Stornoway on the northern part of the Western Isles. I think what I'd also like to draw to attention in this one, the soft coast is also really important for other reasons. So talk about amenity, we talk about nature conservation, we talk about biodiversity. It's a very, very rich piece of coast and it, it needs looking after. Some of the work that Dynamic Coast also did concluded that of all the assets along Scotland's coastline, Type, these types of features, dunes, beaches, salt marshes, protect more than three times as much of those assets than do defended coastlines. Which takes us on to the last bit, artificial coastlines. So this can be ports and harbours, various forms of defences. So this is a bit of, of um, I guess we'd call it revetment work that went in to protect eroding dunes at the very south end of the Montrose Beach. We've got Crivy on the north coast of Aberdeenshire. Crivy um, is, is worth noting. Uh, coming from Holland and England, you will no doubt uh, be very familiar with the 1953 coastal surge and the damage and destruction and lives lost at that cost. It also hit the north of Scotland and this little village here, this was abandoned after the 1953 storm. People just moved away. It took such a battering. 
But over the years, people have moved back, firstly holiday homes and then into more permanent residence. So a very high risk area here and people maybe don't quite appreciate the level of risk that they're they're at. I'd say quite a small percentage of the coast is hard and we want to try and keep it that way if possible. So what types of issues are we facing? Coastal flooding. So we estimate around 28,000 properties currently at risk of coastal flooding in the 1 in 200 or 0.5% annual exceedance probability. That approximately doubles with climate change, but it's kind of a bit misleading that because in terms of, of the real impact of climate change, if you look at damages, the biggest increases are due to the frequency of flooding and the depth of flooding, not necessarily the total number of properties. And a good example of this, this is Stonehaven. This is the town I live in. I live up on the hill at the back here. Um, and this is a piece of modelling work done by JBA for the local authority there. And it, re it aims to reproduce the 2012 coastal flood. The model was validated by photographs provided by the local community and that built up uh, uh, at the early part of the study, a lot of uh, trust and reliability in the work that was being done. And what that showed was if you looked at the end of the century with high emission scenario, that this type of event, the one in 200 year, 0.5%, this was coming close to being an annual event. So quite a game changer. And a lot of that was, as, as Ben hinted at, was not just the sea level rise, but the ability to bring much bigger waves into the shore uh, than, than previously was, was allowed. So erosion, dynamic coast project, again, provided some really, really good information on this. So about 46% of our soft open coastline is currently eroding. Fairly modest average rate there, but obviously rates vary depending on where you are. And that rate of erosion, well, the amount of coast, first of all, that's estimated to be at risk of erosion increases to 75% by just 2050 under high emission scenarios. And at each location, their rates are also increasing. And the other interesting finding of that was that in a lot of areas where we have currently natural features that provide defences to low lying areas, there's a risk that erosion will open up those areas to new those those areas to flooding where flooding hasn't really been a concern before. So some of the challenges we have with erosion. And finally, again, Ben, Ben mentioned this old structures and defences. So. A lot of structures were built in the past. It's hard to understand exactly why. Some pretty nasty um, gabions here um, built to protect the toe of the slopes here. Um, obviously um, not a great idea. They're beginning to break up and the only practical thing to do is, is to remove them. But there's lots of old defences that aren't, aren't justified to be, to be rebuilt. And Scotland had a big fishing industry in the past. There's lots of, of old harbours that are deteriorating. They're no longer uh, necessary to support fishing. And this is uh, you know, allowing bigger waves to crash through the, the former uh, breakwater walls of these harbours and uh, increase in exposure on the, on the coast. Even where we have defences that it is justified to maintain them, and maybe to rebuild them, the real challenge is about making sure that they're up to the standards that are needed to the future. You know, raising sea walls in coastal towns is not a popular choice at all. Um, in many areas, it's difficult to see how we can get around that, but it really isn't a popular thing to do. So even where it's justified, it's still a, a, a significant challenge. The types of impacts we have uh, from flooding and erosion the likes, it's, it's the same sorts of things you'll all be familiar with. Economic and social impacts, disruption to transport here on the, the left hand side of the picture, loss of amenity, those, those beautiful beaches and, and so on that, that are 
you know, gradually disappearing in places. Tourism impacts that ha that has loss of the natural features and the associated biodiversity. And coastal identity, a lot of coastal towns are very closely linked to their 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 coastline. So the bottom corner here is Montrose Beach again. The golf course behind this is the fifth oldest in the world. And so it's not just the, the value of the course itself. It's a history that comes with it that's at risk of being lost. And middle bottom is Scarabray on on um, uh, Orkney Islands, probably one of the most important archaeological sites in the UK, if not the most important. That's at risk of of erosion. And how do we how do we uh, deal with that? Is it a case of recording it for the future? Is it protecting it? Is it moving it? All quite challenging questions. So how do we manage coastal? Uh, the co coastal challenges in Scotland. Local authorities in Scotland are the key. This is one of the first big differences from, from Wales. 24 of 32 Scotland's local authorities have coastlines of varying length. Three of them have over 3,000 kilometres of shoreline to, to, to manage. Local authorities are responsible for building and maintaining defences. They provide assistance on the ground with emergency services. They're responsible for land use planning, for community planning. They lead on shoreline management planning, adaptation plans. So this puts them right in the forefront of, of a coastal adaptation in Scotland. And it also introduces a local political element which can be really positive, but it can also be challenging because local politics is often driven by short time scales, whereas we're needing to deal with long time scales. Oops, double clicked. So in the other organisations, Scottish government provide the strategic direction support through their other agencies. We at the Scottish Environment Protection Agency do flood warning. We produce flood risk maps. We do flood risk management planning and we provide advice on flood risk. We don't have any fixed role on erosion other than where it impacts on on flood risk. And Historic Environment Scotland, Nature Scotland look after our natural and historic assets. And then there's a whole raft of land and property and asset owners who are primarily responsible for protecting their own property. And this includes infrastructure providers. So Ben talked you through shoreline management planning in Wales, what's been happening in Scotland. So it's been very much more ad hoc. Some local authorities, those with probably the biggest challenges, have developed shoreline management plans. There's been no guidance to date in Scotland on how to do that. So they've generally followed the England and Wales guidance from DEPRA and later the EA. Few, if any, have seriously considered coastal adaptation and how long term change may be managed and accommodated. But there is change happening. People can see it. Local authorities are in acknowledging it and Scottish government are sending out very clear messages that we need to start to plan for those changes. The more time we have to make, the more time, the sooner we start, the more time we have to make the right choices at the right time and ultimately the less is going to cost. So there's a lot in the next slide. Uh, first warning is that this is guidance that's under development. It's an approach to coastal change adaptation planning in Scotland. Um, it does have similarities with England and Wales, and we've tried to learn from England and Wales and from other areas. We're particularly interested in the shoreline management plan refresh guidance because that seems to deal with a lot of the, the issues we initially had with shoreline management planning. And the three stages that we're envisaging is this stage one. Get my pen working. So this is the broadly equivalent to shoreline management planning in England and Wales. There are a couple of differences we're looking at. One is, can we change the terminology around the policies 
to make them closer linked with land use planning um, speak and less about lines and more about coastal zones and coastal areas. And the second change is we're proposing to do away with the three stage epoch system because we think that inadvertently what that does is it gives people a false sense of security that maybe they have 20 years of 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 hold the line so they don't need to actually do anything for 20 years and then they find themselves thinking cripes we're meant to be realigning now we haven't even thought about how to do that so moving from recognizing that we have a system now where do we want to get to in the future and how do we plot a route from where we are now to where we need to be regardless of the time scales the second part then is that's a very thick line that's a highlighter sorry about that so uh, the second stage then is about adaptation planning so it's looking at this journey from where we are now to where we need to be looking at the trigger points so what is it that triggers a change that can be an individual storm event maybe that knocks down a defense that you're not going to rebuild Maybe it's an opportunity where you maybe have a, an industrial area that's up for redevelopment and rather than just putting back more assets where you're um, redeveloping old assets, maybe it's a chance to move back from the shore and, and have coastal parks and open spaces that allow for uh, erosion and flooding to be accommodated alongside creating open space and amenity value. Or it could be a whole range of, of, of other things. And the thing is, we don't know exactly when a lot of them are going to happen because we don't know how quickly sea level is going to rise. There are a range of scenarios. We've got good information uh, coming together on what bits of the coast erode, but locally there are complexities there that we do not understand and that we have to develop understanding of. And so this second stage is a really key stage that we've we've got to get right. Um, and the, a lot of the guidance is concentrated on trying to explain how, how local authorities might take this on. And then the third part is the, the the sort of the action plan. So what's what are the what do we need to do now in order to help ourselves along this route? So this can be um, Maybe it's a bit of maintenance on some of the existing defences to buy time to work out different solutions. Maybe it's starting the process of relocation and adaptation and starting those conversations now, um, even though we're currently anticipating that they may not be necessary to be implemented for a decade or more. So this is the sort of approach that we're trying to take um, around adaptive pathways and trigger points and dynamic because we're encouraging you know regular review and 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 reconsideration of what that all involves so finally on the communication challenges um so first and foremost and it's one that we've come up uh, you know off the rails a bit on in, in a couple of occasions is just how to communicate some of those climate change scenarios to communities and um, so they understand uh, you know the uncertainties they understand um, what different scenarios may play out in the future they understand the time scales because if so if we don't get a meter of sea level rise by the end of this century the chances are we'll get it by the end of the next one but also how we communicate that into impacts on the communities themselves so and this is how you take the science as something that can be quite abstract to communities and bring it right into their, you know, their local areas so that they understand what the impacts are, not just listening to the science. So step forward adaptation Scotland, adaptation of Scotland have produced this great little document, um, which is public and local politician and community leader friendly, which looks at 
uh, the UK climate projections and what they mean for Scotland and presents them in a very succinct and, and clear way. So we tend to use that now at, at the at the when we start any engagement with communities, we'll, we'll refer to this document, including with the press and media and so on, any queries they have, we direct them to this document. And then I'm going to go on to talk about the other things about how to engage communities and their representatives to find solutions and the range of skills and tools we need to do this effectively. So communication failure. Um, I was going to show you a short two minute clip from the North East in the Outer Hebrides. I can get the video to work, but I can't get the sound to work. So what I'm going to do is just tell you what's in there. Um, first up is Ian, a local crofter with his uh, cheap dog, his great, great dog. Um, and they're telling us about the experiences they have on the coast and how they see the coast changing and what it means to them as crofters on the on the Outer Hebrides. So it's a real, you know, um, eyewitness account of real changes that are happening and him looking forward to the future with with some realism. I'll post this in the chat afterwards so that you can watch it. It then goes on to look at the airport in Vinbecular, which is threatened by erosion. And here's from the 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 airport managers there. And finally, it looks at an art project in in the in the Outer Hebrides, which uses lasers to project future sea levels onto buildings to try and communicate to communities and peoples what climate change in these scenarios actually means in terms of things that they can relate to. And again, Outer Hebrides seems to be one of the places that's that's moving on um, with greatest speed in terms of, of trying to address engagement and adaptation. So the, the Outer Hebrides is one of, I think it's uh, seven climate beacons in Scotland, looking at how climate change can be communicated to, to public and communities. It's um, they have they have a couple of aims here around engaging communities and exploring climate climate risk, and a couple of the projects are in North East, um, part participatory planning and mapping, you know, trying to capture what people like Ian the Crofter are seeing on the ground, and bringing that together with what the science, the dynamic coast, the flood maps, and so on, are telling us. And another one around creating storylines uh, for uh, climate change, looking at how you translate the scenarios about winter storms from the Met Office into what people are actually seeing on the ground and trying to make that link between the lived experience, as, as they call it, and the science. Um, this is all led by the Outer Hebrides Climate Change Working Group, which is a fantastic partnership of all the, the community uh, organisations, so the local authority, the health boards, and lots of the third sector and voluntary sector working together on this, and supported by people like Adaptation Scotland. And this is Ian, this is the guy in the video who, who tells us what's happening. And the participatory planning gets people like Ian and lots of the other community and residents together and gets them to post um, their experiences, what they see, what what changes they're seeing already uh, in their 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 island and what what they think is happening and what they think might happen in the future. And this combines in with dynamic coast and he comes up with a a list of 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 issues that um, the islands are facing based on the science and the community. So things like erosion, things like flooding, things like less uh, less summer rainfall, bigger coastal, bigger winter storms, and and the likes. The second thing then is around this storyline project connecting climate science with local lived experience. You can tell I've stolen this slide because it doesn't have nice rectangular edges on it like all my other slides. 
This is the work of an artist. And a local artist has been employed and is working with the community now to develop this storyline and in, in how um, Met Office scenarios and, and forecasts can be can be connected into those local local people's experience. And we're hoping that that can be used as a as a, a means to support engagement right across the islands and elsewhere. So that got me to thinking about some of these other areas and, and what we might do with here. You'll remember Crivy, the, the town that was or the village, Fisherman's Village that was sort of destroyed effectively in 1953. How do we look online, find the evidence? Here's one of the houses after the, the waves had hit it. Um, you can see why people might want to move away after that, but uh, online, I also found some of the, you know, a uh, person who was a, she was a young girl at the time the storm hit and just her telling about the experiences of what happened at that time. And, you know, can that help to bring some of these threats and risks uh, to life with the people who currently live there now? And again, Stonehaven back back to my hometown. Um, some really good work at the start. Community really on board with the, the modeling and mapping work. It then went a bit awry at the climate change stage when some, to be quite honest, don't quite buy a fully climate change. Some believe that it can be solved by carbon capture and technology. Some don't want to um, really listen because they they realize that you know it's their properties we're talking about the threats and um, hitting and it's really quite a difficult thing for them to to manage others question us using the high emission scenario as the as the the as the the scenario we used for planning and to try and bring things back again what what the council there have done is have introduced this coast snap initiative, which is engaging citizen science and the local community and actually helping to monitor the beach over the years and how the beach is changing and trying to see, um, you know, are these changes that are are being forecast? Are they, you know, are they coming to pass over time and, and really just getting to know their beach in a different way? Uh, and, and see if that makes a, a bit of a difference. So that's me coming to an end. So it's time for me to be quiet and for the head scratching and the idea generating to start. Neither of us, I think, Ben, if I can say, are, are experts in this. We're, we're learning. We want to learn from you guys what you've done in your areas. How do we communicate complex issues to communities? How can we help relate it to their communities, their properties? How can we learn from them ourselves? You know, what knowledge do they have and how can we use that? And how can, can communities become the solution to coastal adaptation? Uh, something that they're doing to themselves and in control of rather than something that's been done to them. So I think that's going to be the basis of the of the conversations. I think, Petra, I'm going to hand back to you, but I think there's an opportunity to ask any questions and maybe pick up some of the things in the chat first. Yes, oh, thanks for listening. Thank you both very much for your very interesting presentations. It was a very good um, look into you, your coast and your dilemmas, which is very recognisable, I must say. Uh, well, that is the dilemmas itself, because your coasts are quite different than the Dutch coast, for instance. Um, we have collected some questions in the chat um, but would also like to suggest if people want to have more questions just you know raise your hand or if you would like to reflect on the questions Steve uh, had in, in his last slide to have some reflections on that might be interesting as well but maybe you can start with a few questions um, we one from Bart was for both I think how do yeah, insurance correct. companies, yeah, yeah. If you do yeah. it, even better, yeah. Thank you. I was wondering if if the risks are increasing by sea level rise and the community is living there, and also 
companies want to build their offices in, in flood prone areas. Does the insurance companies have a say in this or is it not insurable? Yes, really interesting question, Bart. Um, I think it depends on the insurance companies. I think some, some are willing to take on the risk or the peril, as they call it, and it forms flood risk and change forms a very small part of how one sets an insurance premium, from my understanding. Um, but I think in other areas, so in Wales, where um, communities have hit the news where there is a planned managed realignment and a potential um, removal of the community in the future and, and replace it somewhere else, insurance companies have not well when that hit the news in the early i think 2012 i think insurance companies kind of walked away as did mortgage companies um so people found it very difficult to get insurance mortgages and so forth but the kind of those sort of things have settled down a little bit now i think as as there's more evidence um but that's kind of one one community as a sort of a fairly negative example um I'm not sure what whether insurance companies how they're planning for the future. I imagine they tend, from my understanding, they tend to have better flood risk data sets than we do. So they'll be they'll they'll understand the numbers and the risks moving forwards and where's acceptable now and where won't be acceptable in the future. Um, but I guess as government, we don't have those conversations. Yeah, that was my um, question. Are they a stakeholder? You are, you are communicating, or, or if you raise flood defense, you will reduce their risk. So there is an independency between you yeah. and, and 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 them. So they are a stakeholder for you. They are a stakeholder, and I think, yeah, I think they don't often come along on the journey on new on new flood defenses or upgraded flood defense builds. But I'm sure there'll be an ever increasing interest from them. How would that be in Scotland? So for erosion, I believe erosion isn't an insurable risk. It's a, you know, it's something that is going to happen. And so you can't really insure against losses to erosion. So people are, you know, largely on their own there, although I know some some you know, insurance companies do help out, but I don't think it's it's the norm. In terms of new properties, there's a real challenge in getting flood insurance if anything is built in the floodplain. So I think that's an um, extremely difficult thing to do. I can remember seeing um, one new development um, where as part of the incentive package for selling the homes, they were selling them with three years free flood insurance, which <laughs> kind of ring some red red flags because they clearly didn't want people ringing up insurance companies asking them to insure them. Um, so I think new properties are a challenge and I think it is helping to stop uh, new properties being built in areas of, of, of flood risk. With existing ones, I do think there is, uh, I, I haven't been part of it myself, but there has been discussions between the Scottish Government and the insurance industry about um, you know, investment in defences, but also on continuing to provide insurance to properties that, you know, older properties that are at risk, things that have been there for some time. And there's a, a programme called uh, Flood Re, which uh, shares that risk across, you know, all property owners are paying a, a little bit extra to help to um, is the right word to subsidise? Maybe it isn't the right word, but I think it is to help subsidise keeping costs for those older properties that you know, you know, are, some are at risk of, but aren't new. So I think some that, kind of social benefits. Yeah. So that's that's my my understanding of where we are in Scotland, but certainly strongly discouraging um, development in areas at flood risk. It gets challenging. When you start talking about areas that 
or projected to be at risk of flooding in the future. Legislation's not so strong on that, um, and that's something I think we're we're looking at in the next, you know, sort of a national planning guidance. Thank you very much. I see. My young has a question which she has left already. She needs to go to another meeting. Uh, she asked how local people perceive the news if you present these those flooding maps. I think that was. Steve, I'm not sure. Um, so there, is there a plan for what they would do if this storm event would actually be there? Evacuation plans or something else? Maybe you can reflect a bit on that. Yeah, so I maybe use the Outer Hebrides as again as an example. 2005, there was a big coastal storm and hit the islands and it was a a real tragedy, five five people in, in a family died. Um, I think one of the slides showed uh, a road crossing between some lochs that are linked to the sea, and it was a, a causeway like that that, that they, they died on. They drove off the road and into the loch, which was inundated by the sea. And following that, there was a, a huge response by the local authority in resilience, building resilience, emergency planning, um, looking where people are vulnerable, making sure there were escape routes, making sure there were access routes uh, for emergency vehicles and the likes, and a big push, you know, for people to try and understand what risk they're at. Since then, we've also now introduced new coastal flood warning schemes across the most of Scotland, you know, including the Outer Hebrides, which gives people a heads up. So the idea of having a, a heads up that things, you know, that flooding might happen and, you know, formal evacuation plans and safety plans will, will certainly help. But it is, it is really challenging because you've got the, the issue of the storms themselves, then you've got the issues of longer term inundation. So um, I can't remember exactly when it was, maybe four years ago, there was a whole series of of low pressures came over in the autumn, winter, um, and just battered the, the west coast of Scotland. So low pressure plus westerly wind means the tide stays up, so you get higher high tides and much higher low tides. The land is very low, and so it depends on low water to get water off the land and out to sea. So if the if the tide has been held in by wind, you don't get drainage happening on the land. So that's a challenge. And there was also exceptional rainfall at the same time. And so the playground in the local school in the north of uh, South Uist, that was underwater for pretty much the whole winter. There were some roads that were underwater for the whole winter. And so that's a different, a different thing altogether. And that's where actually some members of the community were actually coming to the council and saying, look, you know, you know, it's no good anymore to, you know, put, you know, um, there aren't diversions. It's no good to close the road, you know, for the duration of the flooding anymore because people can't get around. We need to look to relocate these to safer places. You need to come up with alternatives. And so the, the drive is not only coming from the the public bodies, but it's coming from the communities themselves to try and solve some of these problems. And I think that's that's quite a positive thing that, that you know that's coming from them as well. So the reception in the media is also quite positive then. That way. For instance. Um I think again it's mixed. I think things aren't moving fast enough. Um, there's a perception in the islands that it's 15 years now since that big flood. And yes, there's new resilience, there's new flood warning, but solutions aren't in place. Um, some of the problems they thought that led to those floods haven't been addressed. And so there's, so it's a, it's a mixed bag. There's some positives and some negatives, I think. Um, in there, so. From Wales, 
Would that be the point of view? Yeah, so I think we, we we often have a mixed response to when we present or somebody discovers the sort of flood risk maps of a particular area. It's often a mixed response to whether people believe them or not. I think often because we're portraying fairly extreme flood scenarios, they don't they don't feel it's relevant um, and how that's relevant to the planning system. I suppose. And then we're only just on the cusp of um, publishing climate change maps. And we're kind of we're unsure what the overall reaction is going to be. So the the planning system climate change maps, which are now out there, the actual uh, planning policy behind that has been delayed for a year and a half. So until well, it was delayed half a year ago. So it's going to go live in June 2023, and that's all down to political um, misunderstanding between, behind what what it's trying to betray and actually the impacts on on their cities and their towns, and basically not I think they're not getting the political buy-in, I guess, or the 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 buy-in from the public. So. Yeah, so there is always whenever you talk about climate change, there's there's a hesitance by politicians and, and to to move them forwards and to sign up to all the information that needs to be out there and to really embed it into the the planning system. So it, it is is quite challenging, and I'm sure it's the same on on the other side of the sea as well for you guys. Absolutely. They're, they're working for four years and they do hesitate to make larger decisions you know further ahead and, yeah. and that's it's a worldwide problem <laughs> and Deborah is asking when Steve expects the the three-stage guidance to be published I think you would all like to share your well both of you or your um, reports and guidelines Okay, so I was going to just add a point to that last question. If if, if you don't mind first, then I'll, I'll, I'll take Deborah's question. So, uh, <laughs> so sorry. Um, so the, the, the debate around getting climate change information out there, I think it's how you hedge that as well. It's as public authorities, if we have information that an area is at risk or property is at risk and we don't um, share that. There's bound to be risks associated with that as well. What if a community takes a real battering from uh, a, a big flood event and we had information to say that, you know, that was likely or was possible and we hadn't shared that against the risk of, you know, you know, the, the blight, the negative feedback that, oh, my property's never flooded. Um, I don't think this is right. So th there's that sort of debate to be had as well. I, I'm, and I'm, I'm quite firmly, I think, on the, if we've got information, we should try and get it out there for for people to use. So on, on Deborah's question, so, so that was when's the guidance ready? So Scottish Government are, it's a Scottish Government guidance, so SEPA and others are helping to produce that. We're on a second draft. Um, I'm hoping that the conversation we're, we're having today and some of the ideas about engagement might even make it into that guidance. But I, the, the short answer is it's up to Scottish Government, but it should be this summer because Scottish Government are keen that local authorities in Scotland start this journey as soon as possible and we've started to provide funding to kick the process off to the 10 authorities that are deemed to be the ones with the highest risk. So that money has been provided this year, so they're keen to get it going. But you know, it will be signed off by them when it's ready and I anticipate it'll be later in the summer. Well, thank you very much. I think you have both been talking also about how to 
relates to the communities and how to co-design or co-produce. Um, did you really have some lessons learned? Like, did they, did the other parties come up uh, with new designs or new ideas that were new to you as well? I mean, you were talking about different languages. I think that's very much true. In spatial communities, spatial developments, they have a different time zone, time scale thinking, but also different words they're using. Um, so different language. Um, but if you have done this, if you have already met these people, did they come up with something that was new to you that we can use, that we can learn from listening to you? Steve, you want to, I'm happy to jump in there. So I think from my point of view, um, we're dealing with projects which were looking at decommissioning of flood defences, existing defences, and going to the community to kind of say, these are no longer sustainable assets. We can't afford to keep fixing them. They've already got some fairly significant holes in them. Um, and that was a really challenging task. Um, that's why we needed professional help you know as a as an organization to try and get some of the language right and also to try and resource this kind of takes a lot of resource to you know from a, an officer point of view to kind of uh get that message out there but yeah we had to, it, it it was quite challenging i think and this all relates back to the shoreline management plan as well in terms of the early shoreline management plans that there was some um, consultation during those plans, but tended to be in large population centres where the hold the line policy was going to be enacted. It was actually the, you know, there's huge swathes of other areas, more rural areas, where it'll be more the policy is going to be more aligned with managed realignment or no active intervention, and there's no consultation. You know, five years, ten years ago, around that. Whereas now, as an organisation, we came along and started to say, right, this is this is the plan. It's been in. It's a, you know, we're looking at a managed realignment for this area. It's been in this document for ten years. What do you think? Yeah. And obviously, it didn't go down too well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so. You know, those projects are still going and they're only just on the cusp of that co-production approach. Um, so I think there's that initial very loss of trust with the local, local the, the communities, you know, they're not trusting authority so much. So there's, there's probably a lot of, a lot of needs to be built back. A lot more trust needs to be built back in before I guess you can kind of sit down and, and move forwards. Um, yeah, so it is, it is quite challenging. I, I don't, we've not got it right. I think we need to, we are, you know, I think as an organization changing things, but it just takes a long time to change. And that's where that professional help comes in. And that professional help costs quite a lot of money as well. So, you know, your project costs all start escalating. Um, as well as the questions from the community of all, how much are these consultants costing for you to come to this meeting and present the, these wonderful diagrams and so forth? So yeah, it's lot lots of challenges. I think we'll we'll get there, and um, I think we just have to keep learning from many mistakes, unfortunately, because it's it's not been it's not been done before. So, so I got I got one maybe maybe a bit a bit positive because there there are you know we could certainly pick out a lot of a lot of you know more negative ones but in south east um it was formerly a big estate um the community bought out the estate under the scottish government's legislation so it's now managed by a, a community based organization and you know, conversations were had about them, about how, how they manage some of these challenges. Uh, so I guess to describe the situation, you've got the beach, the beach comes into the dune system, so you get the dune face, then you've got the back of the dunes, and then you're into the, what's called the macker. 
So this is the fertile land on the Outer Hebrides, which is in quite short supply. It's been managed over the years by um, spreading sand and seaweed to create a fertile soil to grow things in. It's great for growing potatoes. Um, but what some of the crofters were doing was they were getting a bit overexcited and they were plowing right up the backside of the, the dunes, which is destabling the dunes. And so the estate came up with an idea, and I'm not sure if it's actually been put into action yet or not. They came up with this idea of um, having a, a kind of a code of conduct for farming in these areas or for crofting in these areas, whereby they would have a buffer zone to the back of the dunes so that they didn't damage the dunes. And then that the potatoes that were grown in this land could be treated as a premium environmentally friendly product and turned into vodka, which could be sold at a premium price. So I really like this idea <laughs> that the landowners could be encouraged to join a scheme that had you know, green credentials that could um, generate a premium income for them because they do struggle um, to make crofting meat. So those are the sorts of ideas that I really like those sorts of ideas, not just because of the vodka, but because of the, the whole concept of what it's trying to do. Um, so things things like that, th those are the sorts of ideas that can come from communities and community groups to try and build a little bit of resilience into, into the systems that they use there. And also systems for how if you there's a feeling that the way croft land works, that some some crofters are taking the hit for all of the rest if they allow things to develop naturally. And if there's some way of, of over time reallocating croft land um, so that the load is shared more, more equally by everyone and not just by the people in the front line. So there, there, there are things that only um, only local communities can come up with ideas like that. You know, you can't, you can't, governments can't really lead them into that. But maybe we can create the the environment for that sort of creative thinking. That's that's what I'm I'm hoping we see a lot more of. And these sort of projects we're seeing in the outer areas, I'm hoping that that's the start of that type of a a process where. The communities can come to the authorities with solutions rather than always the other way around. It'd be very interesting if you could share all these kind of new ideas. So if anybody has some positive reaction to all this, you know, from other stakeholders, it might be very interesting to share because that we can learn from from each other. You know, hints in our own stakeholders. Like, listen to the Scots; they've got some good ideas there. <laughs> it might be very helpful. Um, I think Gunnar has put something in the chat and there's a link to a uh, to a movie. Could you please say a few words on this, uh, Gunnar? <laughs> yes, I can. Yeah. Just raise the right table here. Uh, well, yeah, <clears throat> I'm sorry. It was a movie that we did last year within a project we had actually on a managed retreat in Sweden. Uh, <clears throat> and we wanted to have a way just yes, to communicate with the, the public uh, so this was the actually it was the very first time we ever did a movie at all. So it was a trial and error, but I just thought that I would like to share it with you. It's quite a cute movie, and trying to turn to the the public and also decision makers. They are the public as well. <laughs> so just uh, take a look if you see something you like, and you can just share it. Thank you very much. Also, these kind of things are very interesting to share. I do remember that in Sweden there was also somebody making a dance with some yes, young yes, people. Is that, yes. Is that the same one or is that something else? No, 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 it's not. But we are uh, actually having another project with uh, that woman now. Uh, it's a research project that recently started. Uh, we would like to investigate a possibility to have a flexible land use uh, like um, uh, so to say, an um, intermediate step between the status now, protection and a re retreat. 
uh, and a way to try to use the land flexibly. So that you still, as a landowner, you maybe can gain something for it uh, under way. It can be used for. You had this idea about the potatoes, but it can also be a, a place where you can put caravans or what, whatever during a certain period of time until the sea level uh, gets too high. So, but it has just started, and we are working together with a, a municipality in Sweden, Kalmar municipality, and we will also include artists uh, and work with the public as well. But that will be in next spring. We will go out in the field and uh, invite artists uh, and uh, talk to the public. So we will see. I'll let you know <laughs> when we have more information. Thank you very much. Interesting. If you can, can we look from, you know, online with all these kind of ideas? Will they be published somewhere? I, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I can send you, uh, I will put it in the chat too, the link to the, the project and you can read a little bit more about it. It's recently started, so it's not much there yet, <laughs> but maybe soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, Steve, I did see your hands being raised very briefly. Yeah, I was just hearing the speaker from Sweden. It reminded me of a project uh, we worked on some years ago. It wasn't coastal, but another idea I really liked. It was about looking, it was in, in rivers. It was a Aquarius project, which was about land managers as water managers and how you can encourage them to, to manage water resources for biodiversity and flooding and water shortages. And the Swedes came up with this lovely idea where they had uh, an area where they wanted to set aside a bit of farmland for um, a flood storage um, habitat benefit, but the landowner wasn't interested. But the, um, the local farmers union got together and discussed it and they found that some of the other farmers were actually really keen to do it, but they didn't have land in the right place. So they arranged a land swap. And again, this was a uh, something that, you know, as a government organization, local authority, you could you could never come up with an idea like that and make it happen. That it's the, you know, in this case, the community of farmers that made it happen. And I think it's it's it is about sharing the problems with the people who can come up with innovative ideas like that. So I, I'll always remember that one. I thought it was a really good idea and um, I haven't had a chance to use it yet, <laughs> but one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very nice example. Yeah. Because that's actually an example of your own statement that how can communities become part of the solution, isn't it? Does other people have these kind of um, examples. Let's see if Brett is I'm still in here. I was diving away behind the camera. <laughs> How's that in Wales? Yeah, I think I guess we don't have that. We don't have so many examples yet. I mean, that sounds like a good I think various, I mean, the, the Swedish example of potentially looking at how things can be used before adaptation. I think potentially in Wales, we're jumping to the, we need to do some adaptation and not necessarily thinking what could be done in the intermediate time, um, which is possibly the, some of the frustration um, with, with landowners, but that's kind of, I think, possibly from a lack of forward planning and we're often on the back foot and more reactive and dealing with the the so many unsustainable assets to deal with i guess we, we're not putting the resources into the what we're going to do with the the, ass, the assets which are still standing will stand for the next 25 years but what we're going to do with those um in the in the longer term you know although there's the shoreline management plan you know it's then up to individual bodies to take that that area and and run a project to actually understand what can actually happen in those particular areas and i think we tend to be more reacting to the 
the, the real short term stuff and the, the assets that are falling over and deteriorating and probably not planning far enough ahead. Um, I think because each project is really expensive and you know there's a so I think you know times will maybe need to change a little bit and maybe take the uh, take a slightly different approach. That might be so, yeah. Well, in the Netherlands, we did have drivers from uh, either from water safety, force protection, or from buildings. So we, we, once we build a dune, where we would never have thought of doing that. So because people from the island really wanted a dune uh, protection instead of a hard dike, what we, what, which was there all the time, all along. So they came up with a new uh, new solution. Which we embraced because we loved it very much, but it was a it was not a solution we would come up come up with, and then now we are facing a, a, a challenge that a municipality wants to build new houses near the near a dike, and we are a bit worried that it will, will be a lock-in situation maybe in the far future. So we we are we're struggling how to incorporate the. The things are known in sea level rise and erosion in this area. This is cliff-like. It's, it's a very steep dike, very um, deep waters. Den Helder, if people are from the Netherlands. So it's, it's a bit challenging how to, 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 to incorporate that in all the designs. Um, and the other one we are trying to, do, to set up is to, with some coastal communities, we would like to, to pioneer with a designing by research or research by design. I'm not sure how we are going to do it. But to do this together with spatial planners and people from nature management, how, to, how can we find an optimal solution, an optimal design for the whole coast for 100 years from, from now? Mm. So if you know what we want to go to in the, in the far, uh, far future, then we might know what to do tomorrow. Um, and we will be filling facing the dilemmas that we both have been setting up, you know, the different languages, the different time skills that we're all working on, but also different responsibilities on those coasts. So well, I hope to learn together with all of you guys. I see Bart has raised his hand. Yeah, I think another example of public community in uh, that's not not coastal, but in the uh, in Delta area where a river flows into the, to in the lake and the combination of wind driven uh, upset of the water levels and in combination with some large river discharge the city of Kampen is a danger I don't know if you already have learned of Kampen it's an old uh, Hansa city as we call where the, there's a, a city built on the shore of the river and um, to prevent or to protect against flood risks in fact, we should raise a very high flood defense in front of this city and the people who are opposing, of course, because their old city was destroyed by a flood defense and the fry, uh, free site on the river was destroyed, etc. So at that moment, the community was part of the problem. And I think the, the regional water authority changed it very good to um, let the people be a part of the solution. So what they thought is these houses, if we adapt the houses themselves, they can also be a flood defense. And if we can close the streets, the gates with temporary barriers, then we have also protection. Um, and the people in the city of Kampen are trained to close these flood protections. First of all, they had to accept that a part of their house walls were strengthened and, and et cetera to become an, a flood defense. In, in fact, some of the flood defense just go th straight through a living room. Uh, and they accepted because that the alternative is worse. And every year they are trained to close all the gates in two hours or something like that. And the regional water authorities um, facilitates it, and they have an, uh, an, a meal together. So community um, um, sin, a community um, uh, bounding is also there. Uh, young people, old people, all are working together. I've been there sometimes, several times to to watch. This is really great, and every time. They are competitive. They must do it faster than last year. I think then you have changed the problem to a solution. People are part of the solution. They're really proud of it because they saved their city from a very big impact. And 
um, I'm always well. Really, I'm, I'm proud of the regional water authority there that they they managed to do this. So it's an example of uh, community involvement. The competitive uh, side is also interesting. You might use that, maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Challenge. Challenge. Yeah, the challenge. Yeah, not the young professionals challenge, but a resilience challenge of some kind. <laughs> I see Peter Bateson also has put something in the chat, but he has no mic. I understand quickly. So he's put in a, the a link to the Wrangell Sea Banks. I'm not sure about this project. Does anybody know about this, or should we just look into it? You can all read it. But. It's also working closely together with some farmers to find a solution instead of steering it towards something. Partnership for frontline defense. Very interesting. Thank you, very, Peter, for sharing. We'll look after but if look you mentioned it. there's a link, this is a link, but there's no link in this. Yeah, before it, when before. Oh, it. yeah, yeah. Oh, Zebra, are you still around? I'm here, Petra, yes. Yeah, you know all about it. <laughs> uh, I, I've not uh, watched the link, but I have seen I've seen the videos before of the, the wash banks. Um, so the um, Peter, you might want to, to join in with me on this one because it's a while since I've been involved with this. But um, the, the wash banks project was um, in Lincolnshire around the wash estuary. Uh, we've got a lot of reclaimed land, so we'd had uh, many lines of uh, of defence that have been built over the over the years to to claim land for agriculture. Um, so we have some some relic lines, and then we have new sort of new front lines that have developed over the years. Um, following the um, tidal surge in 2013, uh, we had overtopping and a breach actually in one of the uh, one of the uh, defence lines. Um, so on one section of the the um, frontage, we've strengthened and improved the uh, the wash banks, uh, the actual frontline defence. So adapting to that climate change by uh, increasing the defences and building resilience into uh, into the banks themselves. But on one of the adjacent breaches, the um, the breach wasn't repaired. Uh, so we were able to rely on um, sort of a relic line that had been there previously that sits behind the land. Uh, and that land is now sort of um, starting to create the salt marsh habitat. Um, and we do need to create salt marsh habitat around the estuary um, as we get that coastal squeeze. So it was uh, sort of a, um, the, the success of creating salt marsh, um, but also we did have that sort of retired line. So I suppose it's something for us to think about for the future is, is there are two forms of adaptation within, within those estuaries. One is to, to sort of build higher, but then compensate that with making space for, for water and that habitat creation um, so the, the two. Is that anything to add, Peter? He doesn't have a microphone, so maybe in the chat. OK. Not yet. Boo mic, no mic. No mic, no <laughs> mic. Um, <laughs> Boo mic is also good. good. The, the, just thinking about communication and, and sort of how we communicate that adaptation, though. He goes on to <laughs> <laughs> um, So just thinking about the um, the uh, communication, we we um, did work with the landowners on on both sites, um, and one was um, you know sort of where they they had that managed realignment. Um, sort of describing the, the benefits um, that uh, that they could seek um, with regard to that salt marsh um, habitat creation, but then also on the adjacent where we were looking for the um, sort of that adaptation in resilience and building, you know, sort of building back better. Um, there was a lot of work done with where we were going to um, gain materials from for actually doing the construction works there. So we worked with the local landowners and material was taken from behind the defences to, to bolster those, those, those frontline defences. And whilst you're doing that, it is that sort of communication about the benefits. They were going to lose small parcels of land for, for agriculture. Um, but as part of that, they were going to get that resilience for the future and that adaptation. So it's looking at the um, sort of the win-win and being able to describe the opportunity that you're going to get by sort of taking um, something that on the on the first conversation was certainly thought to be 
uh, something a, a detrimental move to, to sort of lose a little bit of, of, of agricultural land. But actually, when you describe the opportunity and the resilience that you're building in for the future, um, that that sort of balance of giving up some land versus inundation of saline water onto grade one agricultural land in the future. Um, you, know, you have to get those that communication right and be able to to demonstrate the benefits versus the um, what can be perceived as the negative. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Are, are you also thinking of using this? Did I understand correctly? Maybe that you are going to use these marshes to build up in future bacillus runs, and also use it then again when it's built up a bit for for farmland in the future. We we don't actually use from uh, materials from the front of the um, uh, the d defences on the estuary here. They're they're very highly um, protected from an environmental point of view. Um, we've not been able to use the um, the materials from the wet side of the defences for for quite some years now, which is why we had to have that negotiation with landowners about taking materials from behind the defences. Um, and obviously, the role that the salt marshes play in breaking up wave energy and things like that is is important. So also helps with the um, that resilience of those defences as well. But it is a, a point of um, regular discussion uh, around the the wash estuary as to whether or not that historic practice of, of gaining the materials as the um, we get that um, accretion on the defences is is the right thing. But at the moment, it's it's something that um, due to environmental designation we don't do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Same dilemma we are facing on. Yeah. I see Steve has put something in the chat. Any link, I think? Oh, sorry, that was just to the video of the Ian and the airport and the art project that projected the laser lines on the buildings. That was the link to that video on YouTube for anyone who wants to watch it after. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have a look. We have lots of things to watch later on. Yeah, <laughs> that's very nice. Is there anyone who would like to have some final remarks or questions or dilemmas to discuss? Steve, yeah, just burst in. Yeah, um, I guess what I what I'm really struggling with is the the sort of the I think it was the fourth point that oh no. Yeah. No, it was one of the earlier points I made about understanding the. Uh, let me just check this from my presentation because I can't actually remember. Uh, understanding the range of skills um, and tools required to do this effectively, so particularly the range of skills. So. In Scotland, we're about to ask local authorities to dive into this um, coastal adaptation planning and come up with some you know good long term solutions and and so on so in orkney islands for example um there's a good start there in that the it's been led by the land use planning team with support by the engineers so it's not to say engineers can't do this they they certainly can and and have a role to play in that but land use planning is something we've always struggled to um, get fully linked into the shoreline management planning process. So this is this is really good. But then there's also the community planning and the engagement sides and. and you know, a lot of local authorities are only are only funded to a limited extent to, to do this. And there's questions about you know, do we expect all 24 local authorities in Scotland each to develop their own skills and resource sets or are there ways of, you know, sharing resources across local authorities for those, you know, really sought after skills? So the sorts of stuff that people like Adaptation Scotland did, I think is really, really good. And I think Probably it's an org a national organisation like that is probably best place to do that. But I, I just want to know how other people, you know, how you when you're dealing with these problems, how you find and um, what's the right word? Um, 
so I'm not usually quite as bad as this, um, activate resources, sort of get get the right skills working on the on the, on the jobs. <laughs> How do you identify them and get them engaged uh, so that they can they can do that? Because it doesn't it doesn't seem to happen naturally. <laughs> so. So uh, have other countries got experience of building teams of multi skilled professionals to tackle adaptation? I guess that's my question in the end. Anyone would like to reflect on this? Um, otherwise, well, the water authority, regional water authorities of the Netherlands, they have a close link with the municipalities, for instance, but also with the national um, national um, authorities. So usually we think of ourselves as should be having the knowledge, should be able to uh, give advice. Um, if it is when within uh, within municipalities, if they have questions about what are what's going to happen, we have a Met office like yourself who's giving some insights, uh, also more regional, and then we try to translate that into what that means for also defence or droughts or uh, stuff like that, in almost a polder uh, level, so very regional, very local almost. Um, on the other hand, the, the national uh, national government is also working on, uh, yeah, Bart High School, against promise Age Boost there, knowledge see on sea level rise. Yeah, sea level yeah. rise knowledge program. <laughs> well, that's a very large pro program trying to involve everybody. Um, but there is a difference between these programs, because it usually um, involves professionals. But if you want to discuss with people, you know, how are you going to do adapt, incorporate that in your spatial planning? I think that usually it will be our water authority, um, the regional water authorities, and we are teaming up to have the right knowledge on the right place and have the right discussion on the right place. But we are struggling, especially when you actually want to know about long term planning, or long term ideas, and how to to make decisions today and tomorrow, because as well, we have all stated, our politicians really need that, but also to to connect with the local authorities, you also need to speak their language. So how to get, how to switch from long-term to short-term is a big challenge. So that we recognize, certainly. But also in the beginning, you also said that if you have knowledge you should share, it was one, a uh, lawyer that once stated that, he made, made a, a research on that, and this, they state now that if you have knowledge, you are obliged to share it. It's not that you can share it, but you have to. Um, so in that case, then we say, well, we, we know a bit about, about it. We are a logical partner to dive a bit more into it because we know already quite a lot about our water system. So we feel it is our role to have an advisory role not the steering role, because that's not our uh, responsibility. And that is what we also, we need the provinces and we are going to need the, the national government for, for bigger decisions. If we have to relocate the whole of North Holland to the west, to the east, <laughs> for instance, well, that may might be very, very far future, but if, even nearby future, if we do think that will be some big, decisions will have to be made and that is not so easy if it's not in your uh, jurisdiction area then you will have to cooperate with others or it would be even be better if a province or a national board would be able to steer that doesn't really help you does it <laughs> but yes we do struggle with the same dilemmas that you are working on i think <laughs> deborah would you like to reflect on this just to, to make a similar point really is that the um, political cycle is short uh, and therefore the continuity of the messaging needs to come from the officers be it in local planning authority for us or within the environment agency um, and I think it does need to be those messages need to be owned by um, us for example in the environment agency rather than our consultants because they can do a lot of the work, they can do 90% of the work, but the actual ownership of the messaging, I think, needs to be from that accountable person. 
Uh, I think otherwise, if we ask others to go out and take these messages, the credibility and the your ownership of your place um, is is it's not there. And I think we've had challenges in the past where we've taken out some quite difficult messages around the flood risk that we have on the Lincolnshire coast to communities. And if it hasn't been those of us that work on the ground day to day and go out to those parish council meetings and go out to the, those local meetings, it's not the regular face that they recognise. They don't, it's not that they don't believe what they're being told, but they don't think that anybody, you know, that, that people are caring and they're going to be there for the long term and are, are there to kind of represent the community. And I, so I do think it's really important that um, we are able to bring people in to create those teams for the longer term uh, to get that ownership. Um, difficult, you know, sort of resources and finding people that have that experience and, and skill sets is, is actually really difficult at the moment. We're, we're finding it incredibly difficult to find people with sort of a good blend perhaps of engineering uh, knowledge so they have the credibility when they're talking to people but also those softer skills um, for communicating and engaging on some really quite difficult messages. I think that that, that resonates with us as well actually Deborah I think in, in Wales definitely it's a real real challenge and you know where we I think in the past where we've used consultants to present the problem and the you know here's the, here's a scheme it's kind of people want to know well, where's the where's the the nrw offices to be presenting this and you know to say oh we just don't have the resources to to uh manage this it kind of doesn't go down well um and so we have we've appointed probably only just one one person really as that face to help move us forwards but i think in that's kind of a we need more people uh, moving forwards um, as as and when the projects grow and there's going to be more of them. But it is it's quite a specialist skill set, isn't it, to kind of have that engineering knowledge and be able to talk about that and you know and be have that continuity with the communities. So I have long roads of communication to go. I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any latest, latest remarks, ideas, questions to share? What? I just yes. made a call for the next webinar. Who's interested to contribute to the subject adaptive maintenance strategies? And the idea behind it is that uh, given climate change impact, uh, heavy precipitation in the winter or in the summer, high water uh, floods, etc. your normal maintenance strategy that you do in seasons is not applicable anymore. So you have to change your strategy. And your asset should, in fact, 365 years a year be uh, available. So in this webinar, we want to exchange your ideas, your experience, your practices on the adaptive maintenance strategies. So we want to contribute is welcome. And you mean you, you, you're uh, searching for some extra uh, speakers also? Yes, yeah, that's what I mean with contribute. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's a wise open invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, Catalina, you have a question? Raise your hand. Yes, hi. Um, very interesting. So I, I work for a university, so I've been very interested in this communication part, and I've been in a project with Petra as well. And, and the time scale issue, I think that comes back a lot. So I recognize a lot of the things that have been said. And I also wondered how much you also sort of in, in this com communication try to start in the past. So you look forward like 100, 200 years scenarios, but in sort of taking that story, if you look 200 years back, I mean, not just the sea level was different. I mean, it was different 200 years ago, but many things so how, how are you trying to take that into account if, if you're communicating change historical perspective but... yeah steve and ben one of, each of one of you so yeah so um typically uh, uh you know when a when a project starts to look at 
providing you know flood defense or whatever one of the first things that's done is a, like a historical review of yeah. you know past flooding events and that can be really useful to yeah inform what the risk is but also validate models and and so on but i think there isn't there isn't the sort of complementary bit to that, which is not looking at flood events, but just how things have changed over time. I think England and Wales have got a strategic monitoring program where they're, you know, building up over time, yeah, you know, and how the coast is changing at, yeah. at, you know, a really high level of detail. And I think that will be, you know, really valuable in the future. But some of the things I think, again, I keep coming back to the Outer Hebrides, but again, some of the things that we've heard there is that I was astonished to come across a, an article in one of the national newspapers about an event that happened in the 1700s <laughs> on the Outer Hebrides, where there was a, a big event that basically brought a huge amount of sand from the beaches onto the fertile land behind it, so much so that it created a, a mini famine for the next three years because it just destroyed all the crops and lots of people um lots of people had to leave because they just couldn't live there anymore and was a number of years so and and i think this is part of what the storylines thing is trying to do is trying to say you know you live you know you may if you look at this coastline on a day-to-day -day basis you maybe see one type of change you maybe see um the, the swash line varies from one day to the next but you don't see these other changes that happen and trying to find those significant changes over time some of which happen gradually but some of which can happen just like that you know you can have a big event like the scarabray um the the archaeological site um that was exposed because the sea broke mm -hmm. through into a, a a loch and it created a completely new coastline where it had been a a loch before with a barrier beach yeah. at the front so and, and that was exposed because of that event so these changes can happen gradually or they can happen yeah. really sharpish and i think there is a really useful thing to to learn there as well as just the flood events records yeah. you know what is that history of that place and i think i have to find out more but i think that's what these creative projects in the yeah. outer Hebrides. this is the sort of thing they're trying to do it's, it's a bit to this link that like is it real like these extremes yeah, yeah. because i indeed the bit of so uh, my background is more in in uh coastal geomorphology bit i work at the engineering uh department right now so we're, we're in this Mix, but I, I realize so much that if you want to change something, it's it's really about the people that you try to do this for. <laughs> they, they have to be part of this. I mean, it's not something imposed. And I, I think I can't even tell what is the best solution. I mean, it's very local. So I, I, I'm very interested in everything being said. So uh, uh, I have to keep uh, con connected to this to uh, also learn from this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... More things to come, more things to say, to share, or to ask. This is your... Then I would kindly invite you also for the next meeting, it will be the 2nd of June, where we reflect on sea level rise on the Caribbean islands, Dutch Caribbean islands, will be in Saba and Curaçao, um, which will be quite different coasts <laughs> altogether. Uh, but also we can learn, I think, from Saba and... Uh, so Saba is struggling with both fluvial and sea level erosion, sea, level, sea erosion. Um, and Curaçao is struggling with um, long-term planning, but also with short-term planning, also because of economic struggles they are facing at the moment. Um, so we two quite different uh, presentations also. Uh, so be very welcome to, to join us there also. And then I would like to thank Steve and Ben for their very interesting presentations. I will upload them to the to the Queen website. Um, also the recordings for other people who did not join and even last minute questions like please do record record it so we can watch at another time. 
So thank you very much. Thank you everybody for joining us and I hope to see you all on the 2nd of June. Thank you, Petra. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for thank listening. You. Thank you. Bye. Please. Bye.